Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight from wherever you are. My name is Jen Panarski, and I'm a communications officer with the City of Kingston. You are at the city's online public engagement session for Bert Mounier Common and Max Crescent Park. We had 36 people register to participate participate tonight and 29 people have logged into Zoom so far. We are now live streaming uh, to YouTube and the session is closed captioned. We are going to start our presentation this evening. So a few housekeeping things before we get started. Um, like I said, this session is live streamed and recorded with closed captioning. And to protect the privacy of all of our attendees tonight, your videos and microphones are currently turned off. Um, I'm going to cover a couple of troubleshooting, uh, a couple of technology troubleshooting questions that often come up when we do the online sessions. Um, if you're having problems with Zoom, there are some different view options that you can use um, to uh, enhance the, uh, the screen in front of you. Um, those tips are over on Get Involved Kingston. Um, if you are having some issues that you think could be easily resolved, you can use the chat function in Zoom to let us know uh, specifically what your concern is. If you accidentally get disconnected from the session, you can always call into the meeting from your cell phone or from a landline. I'm going to read out the phone number and the webinar ID if you'd like to write it down. So the call-in number for tonight's session is 1-647-374-4685. And the webinar ID is 964 6508-5673. And if you get disconnected from YouTube, or sorry, if you get disconnected from Zoom, you can always log in and watch on the city's YouTube channel. We will have a Q&A session as part of our online engagement this evening. And there's a couple of ways that you can ask questions. So you can ask in writing by typing in the Q&A area and your name and your question will be uh, visible to participants. And when we recognize your question, we will just use your first name. You can ask a question verbally during the Q&A period as well. And so to do this, use the raise hand function in Zoom and we will turn on your microphone. And when we recognize you, we'll also again use your first name. If you are calling in by phone, please, please press star nine to use the raise hand function and then we will turn on your your microphone so you can drop in questions anytime during the q a but we will address them all in uh, the formal q a part of the session and all of the q a responses will be shared in the project reporting back If you have joined us either online before or in person for an engagement session, uh, the city has guidelines for participation that were helped develop by other residents. Going to give everyone um, about 30 seconds to review all of the uh, guidelines for participations that we have. If anyone has any concerns with the guidelines, please use the raise hand function to let me know. Okay, seeing no concerns with the guidelines for participation, I'm going to turn it over to Patricia Sharp now. Great, thank you, Jen. Hello, everyone. Um, it's really great to see so many people in attendance and I'd like to thank you for joining us tonight and for trying out this new format for public consultation. Uh, this evening, we're going to present the proposed plans for two parks in the Cataraqui North neighborhood. One is for a new park, uh, Max Crescent Park, and the other is to present new amenities that are proposed for the existing Burt Munier Common. I am Patricia Sharp and I am the project manager for both of the projects. I'm with the par Parks and Shoreline Department in Engineering Services at the city. Mm -hmm. Joining me tonight are Neil Unsworth, the manager of Parks and Shoreline and Engineering Services, and 
We also have Steve Bendo, who is leading the team from RK and Associates. They're the landscape architecture firm that we, we hired the city to design the park projects. Um, I'd also like to mention that the district councilor, Simon Chappelle, is in attendance. And now Steve will be presenting the proposed plans to you. Actually, no, he won't. I'm gonna give you a bit of background first. Next slide. Um, so I, I've located both of the parks on this slide so that you can get a sense of where they are. Uh, Burt Munier Common is the larger green area on the lower part of the screen and is labeled number one. And the blue line that you see is showing the focused area for the proposed improvements. Max Crescent Park is indicated by the blue line in the upper right quadrant of the screen and it's labeled number two. Uh, both of the park improvements are funded by development charges and the budget for Max Crescent Park is approximately $250,000 and the budget for Burt Munier Common is approximately $400,000. Um, next slide. Uh, this is an aerial view of Max Crescent Park. Um, it's slightly out of date in that it was taken when the phase when the phase of the subdivision to the north was just starting to be constructed. Uh, if you were to see it now, the roads and the homes are have been constructed. The park, which is outlined in blue, is primarily wooded. Uh, some forestry work was done on the woodland by the developer, and that was done in consultation with the city a couple of years ago. The park plan that we are presenting tonight incorporates the woodland into the plan, and the park is about two acres in size. Next slide. Uh, this is an aerial view of Burt Munier Common. Uh, the, central, the central and eastern portion of the park was developed approximately six years ago and contains a playground, splash pad, and a gazebo. The proposal we are presenting today focuses on the central and western side of the park. In the western part of the park, the developer completed some site preparation for us. He graded the site and seeded it with grass, and that was done about seven years ago. And the whole park from the east to the west is about 6.7 acres. Now I'm going to hand it over to Steve, who will walk through the proposed plans for both of the parks. Great. Thanks, Patricia. Please, please. Uh, the next slide, please. Well, first I'm going to talk about the Max Crescent Park uh, and the site plan for Max Crescent Park. Just so everyone is aware, the top of the drawing is north. Uh, so Anderson Drive is to the west, Max Crescent is to the north. Uh, the park itself is located at the southeast intersection of those two, two roads. Uh, now as part of this park, uh, I'm sure many people are aware that it, it, there is an existing woodlot, woodlot there. So in the development of our plan, what we have uh, tried to accomplish is uh, to retain as many of the existing trees as possible. You'll see on this plan that we have a two and a half meter wide asphalt walkway that connects to the sidewalks at both Anderson Drive and Max Crescent Park. At the middle of that walkway, uh, there is a, the proposed playground area. The playground itself will be a wood fiber surfacing and adjacent to the, the playground, we're looking at installing two accessible benches on concrete pads. Now we chose that corner of the site because there's, it, it's quite an open area. Um, so with this design, we're able to mitigate any impacts to trees uh, and we don't anticipate having to remove any of the trees uh, at that location. Another aspect of this, this site is we're looking at providing some, some nature trails, basically a, a 1.2 and a 1.8 meter wide limestone walkway. Uh, the walkways will connect from the playground down to the walkway block, uh, sort of at the south of the site that connects to Lisbon Ave Avenue. And then there will be another limestone walkway that weaves throughout the site, uh, crosses uh, an existing drainage channel and then connects back to the sidewalk uh, at the north side on Max Crescent. The intent of, of this walkway, what we will be doing with the city is going out onto the site and, and field staking uh, this walkway. Uh, the reason we're doing that is uh, to be able to, to fit it into the existing topography well, 
but also to avoid any of those mature trees. After we do stake up that trail and we, we confirm the exact location, we'll have an arborist go out, review the site for any hazard trees and any trees that require pruning. Uh, but again, the intent of this is to, to avoid all of the mature trees within, within the park. The existing drainage channel, we would like to formalize that a little bit more uh, and, and give it a, a naturalized uh, sort of stream bed look. So looking at some, at some cobblestones with some large rocks, and then also providing a stone slab bridge to cross over top. It's somewhere where kids can, can walk through, they can, they can leave the trail and start to explore uh, the, the natural surroundings. Also, as part of this plan, we're looking at doing some enhancement plantings, which you'll see in the, uh, the green circles are the proposed trees, a mix of native deciduous and coniferous trees. At the east end of the park, uh, you'll see sort of a figure eight uh, green, green area, uh, which indicates a berm. Just beyond that, there is a, an industrial area. So we're looking at creating a bit of a berm in there to, to help screen that area, and then doing some naturalized planting on top of that. Uh, next slide, please. So for this site, we've, we've developed two different playground options. Uh, the first playground option has a bit more of a natural feel to it. The play structure itself is constructed out of a, a wood called Rabinia, a very nice finish on it, uh, rot resistant, and it really goes with that natural feel of, of a woodlot area. <clears throat> the play structure itself, I'll go through some of the play components just to give an idea of uh, the reasoning behind the, the the choice of those components. So the first thing we, I'd like to talk about is the slide. From a physical aspect, what the slide is helping children with is uh, to develop their balance and their core muscles. From a social standpoint, really what it's going to do is it, it helps them to, to learn how to take turns uh, with other children. Within the structure, there's also a low desk where, where kids will be able to, uh, to meet, uh, have some creative play, and, and it helps with their communication and cooperation skills. On one side of the play structure, as you can see in perspective three, there is a, a, an inclined uh, rock climber. What this helps children with is cross coordination. So left hand, right hand, left foot, right foot, uh, developing both, both sides of the brain, uh, as well as arm and, and hand strength. Uh, the, having a slight incline on it, it's well geared towards younger children, it makes it a little bit easier for them to climb and get that sense of accomplishment uh, when, they, when they are able to, to get to the top of the wall. Also in perspective three, you can see uh, an overhead monkey bar climber. This is something for children a little bit older. It helps with their arms uh, and upper body strength development, uh, balance and coordination. We also have a, in perspective two, at the front, you can see a, a small spring toy. It's a forest bug springer. And this is something that, again, will help with arms and hands and, and muscle coordination. But it also, cognitively, it, it, it helps children, it trains them in uh, to understand cause and effect. So as I move forward, the spring pushes back at me and it helps with their, with their balance and the physics of that movement. Now, we're also looking at, at providing a spinner bowl, which is, is number three in perspective number one. This, this element, uh, it, it's something that works on their balance and coordination. Uh, socially, being a single standalone element, they're going to uh, develop their, their, their turn-taking skills. And then cognitively, uh, it's sort of like a little physics class for them. As they spin around in that, uh, like a figure skater, if they pull in tighter, they'll spin faster. And as they, they move their arms out, they'll, they'll go slower. And the final feature that we have on, on this plan is a log climber, or uh, uh, sorry, a ground level log component, which is geared towards developing balance for children. Now, if we could go to the next slide. This is a, an example uh, of that structure, which is installed at another park in the city of Kingston. It's at Fairway Hills Park. And you can really see the, the nice finish on the wood. 
it's not your, it, it is a Robinia structure. It's all skinned down and smooth and very safe. Now, if we go to the next photo, it will show you uh, uh, another perspective uh, from the other side of it. We can go to the next slide. <clears throat> so playground option two is more of a traditional uh, structure. It's composed of metal and plastic uh, component components, all, all, all powder coated painted material. Now, very similar to the first structure. Uh, this one has a slide working on those same development skills, uh, balance and core development. Uh, in this option, we have a, a double slide. You can also see that there's a in perspective one sort of a, a hexagonal letter or ladder that goes up to the second deck. This will be similar to that inclined climbing wall on the first option where it provides the children the left, left foot, right foot, left foot, right hand uh, climbing development. In perspective two, at the front of this option, you can see that there is a, it's called a Zyra spinner. Um, and it's a stand up uh, spinner that wobbles back and forth. Again, there's cause and effect associated with that, helps children with balance, core and upper, upper body strength. If you look at the perspective number three, just to the left hand side, there is a climbing access ladder uh, to the structure. This is again working on upper body strength and the coordination of left hand and, and right hand. I think that is that is all that I have for, for these ones. So uh, would we like to move on to Bert Marigny? Yeah. Okay. So for Bert Marigny, uh, again, the orientation of this one, the north of the drawing where you see the residents, that, that's, the north, that's the, the top of the drawing is the north on this, the left-hand side is the west. The south side of this site, uh, there's a private laneway that has townhomes backing onto it. The entire site is on the, in the western portion of Burt Union Common. As part of this development, we wanted to consider the connections to the existing walkway blocks. So in, in the development of our two and a half meter wide asphalt path, we have connected to the walkway block, which is to the west. And then it arcs up to the north to connect to the walkway block between the residences and back down to connect to the pathway system that's in the Burt Munier Common Central Area. With this design, we provided a 40 meter by 60 meter informal rectangular play field. Uh, we would anticipate that there would be some soccer goals install, installed in here for, for informal play. On the northwest and the northeast corners of the site, uh, we'd like to bring in some naturalized features. So looking at more of a, a, a meadow type feel with tree planting in you know, throughout it. Uh, the intent of this, this successionary planting would be that it eventually will develop into to more of a wooded area, uh, providing screening for the residences, uh, but also it's, it's quite an open and large space. So it'll help to create a, a more enclosed space uh, and more comfortable space in the site. On the Southern end of the, the site, running from the, from the east all the way to the west end is an existing drainage ditch. We'd like to look at naturalizing this feature. Uh, it is not a usable space for the public. So again, sort of enclosing the space a little bit more to create some comfort for the users of this site. If we go, could we go to uh, the next slide, please? <clears throat> Option number two for Burt Mean is is fairly similar uh, as far as programming goes to, to option number one. In this one, the key difference is in the central lawn area. We're looking at a more of a, an elliptical shape in here without uh, an, any type of uh, sport field type play. So not looking at soccer goals in this one. And by shrinking this area down uh, width wise, we're able to have a smoother arc to the path. It provides a little bit more of a direct connection between the west walkway block and the east 
at the east side of the site where it would connect to the to Bird Media Commons Central. And we'd still maintain a walkway connection to the north. And similar to option number one, the northwest corner, the northeast corner, and the southern edge would be naturalized to, to really enclose that, that space and, and strengthen the, the, the shape of that oval. If you go to the next slide. This one here is, is looking at the basketball options for uh, the Burt Mounier Common. Uh, and this is in the central area. So on the right hand side of the drawing, uh, which is the east side, that's where the existing playground and the spray pad are. So if we look at basketball court option number one, uh, looking at something on the, the southern edge of the open lawn. Uh, this one is a, an east-west orientation. Uh, ideally basketball is played north-south just because of the, the sun angle. So when you're taking shots in the evening, you don't have the setting sun in your eyes. Uh, this one, we wanted to provide a, a, a different orientation uh, than option number two. The court itself would be similar in size to a high school gym uh, playing a, a cross court basketball. The key and, uh, and the foul line would be regulation. The net would be regulation height. Uh, and there's a truncated three point line uh, in both of these options. Both of the courts here would be covered in a, a, an acrylic non-slip surfacing and they would both have walkway connections uh, to them. When we look at option number two, uh, we've moved it further towards the playground and the spray pad area. Now where you see the number three, that indicates there's a concrete seat wall there. Now, there is an existing slope there, so we wanna take that opportunity to create a bit of a, a concrete seat wall to first of all, retain the slope, but it provides all the players a nice area to drop their gym bags and sit and, and watch the game. This option does not have a sideline on it, um, but it does have, uh, we call it the barrel shape, provides a little bit more play area uh, through the center half of the court, uh, but also some area for, for kids to mingle and, and watch the game and gather. Uh, connections would be, again, there are two connections, one to the north side of the court and another to the south side of the court. Both of the options we're looking at doing tree planting around to provide some shade and some coniferous trees to provide some visual screening for the site. Now if we can move on to the next slide. This slide here, uh, just basically number one, uh, it indicates where we have identified the first option, basketball court, and then number two is uh, the second option. As you can see in the middle of this drawing is where that uh, there's the existing sun shelter, playground and, and spray pad. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, I'm going to, uh, we've received several questions and comments for both parks in advance of this evening's session. Uh, so I'd like to address uh, the questions that we've got for Max Crescent Park first before we talk about Burnt Munier Common. So uh, the first inquiry we had was about tree removal at Max Crescent Park. And I think maybe Steve addressed it in his presentation, but I'd like to reiterate that uh, the developer did forestry work in the woodland at the time when they started building the subdivision to the north a couple of years ago. Um, their work would have included the removal of diseased, dead, and hazard trees. Um, and some of the understory was also removed at that time, but it's since started to regenerate and we expect it to fill back in. So as Steve mentioned, we'll be adding more trees, which will be both deciduous and coniferous native species. No further significant tree removal is expected when we're developing the park. Uh, the existing trees were considered when we located both the playground and the pathways and keeping the existing woodland as a park feature is very much desired. Um, and are there other questions about Max Crescent Park that we can address now and then we can move on to um, Burt Munier. Uh, 
I think, actually, I think I saw one that I can answer. It was the question, Jen, I, I will Yeah, just... Patricia, I can help with this. Okay. Um, so thank you everyone for your questions. Like Patricia said, we're going to address all the questions about Max Crescent right now. Um, if you have typed in questions into the chat function, can I just ask you to repeat those ones in the Q&A and that just helps us make sure that we capture everything. Um, if you have technical problems, please do use the chat, um, but we're trying to keep all those questions in the, in the Q&A. Um, I'm actually going to start with, um, with a question that would like to be asked verbally and that's from Verlana. And if your question's about, uh, uh, sorry, Bert Mounier, um, you can lower your hand. So Verlana, Take it away. It's all yours. She's muted. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Oh, great. Yes. Uh, so my question was about the trees at Max Crescent. And you did more or less answer my question. And I really commend you on, the, it's a very progressive plan if you're not gonna cut down all those trees, especially the evergreens. And so that was my question. So, but I think you even answered that, that even all those very old tall evergreens will remain in that space. Is that correct? Yes, that is question. Yes. Okay. And that's I, I, I got, I, I actually prepared the question because I remember getting your question ahead of time for Lana. Okay. So that's wonderful. I really commend you guys on that. And as for the choices of A or B for the playground, I think A, the more natural wood is uh, the preferable one. And that's just my opinion. Thank you. Thanks for Lana. So we're going to move on to the questions that are in the Q&A. Um, so we have quite a few, so just bear with us. Um, so the first question we have is from Erica and Erica asks, is the wood structure option one wood material or is it synthetic? Asking for the purpose of durability. I'll take that question. The the structure is uh, a wood, a natural wood structure. It's made of uh, robinia wood, which is a very dense wood, uh, very high quality with high quality finishes on it, uh, e extremely durable. Uh, so there, uh, we don't have any concerns with the wood that is used for that structure. Uh, it, it's proven to be a very successful product in the past. And, and as I had mentioned, it is installed at uh, another park in the city. Um, and I'd encourage anyone if they, if they want to go have a look, it's at Fairway Hills Park. Uh, it's quite a nice structure. Thanks, Steve. Okay, we're going to move on to a question from Arthur. And he asks, do either options for the Max Crescent Park provide interior park lighting, such as pathway lights? Living nearby, the area is very dark at night, and the light from street lights can't penetrate very far into the park area. I'm worried about people walking through the park at night especially from Lisbon Place. Thanks, Arthur. Um, at this point, we haven't looked at uh, putting any lighting in the park, but I think that maybe Patricia would be uh, best to sort of uh, uh, yeah. speak further to this one. Yes. Uh, no, we haven't uh, considered lighting for this park. It is quite a small neighborhood park um, and um, we, uh, lighting would not typically be something that we would uh, could warrant the expense for. Um, and in terms of your question about coming from using the path to go from Lisbon Place uh, across over to the corner of Anderson Drive, um, I, I realize that that would be quite dark at night. However, there is an alternative street route that could be used if someone was concerned for their safety. Okay, hey, thanks, Thank Patricia. You. We're going to move along to a question from Rochelle and her question um, is regarding Max Crescent. Anderson Drive is quite busy and will get busier once Cataract Ray Woods is extended. Is the play structure placed far away from the road? Yes, it is, Rochelle. It's, 
I can't say exactly how far, but it's it's probably about 20 meters or so uh, away. Uh, it is tucked within that site and separated from the roadway by there is a boulevard and the sidewalk, and then it's internalized in, in that area. Uh, beyond the back of the playground, uh, we are looking at having that naturalized too. So there wouldn't be a, a direct connection from the from the northern edge of the playground through the woodlot to run across the road. So I, I think that uh, from a safety standpoint, uh, it, it is uh, fairly far from the road and access is generally going to be only from the asphalt walkway into that play area. Okay, thanks, Steve. Um, there's a couple of questions in the Q&A that are about the timing and the questions are about the timing for both parks, but I'm wondering if the project team can address timing specifically for Max Crescent. I can, I can answer that question. Um, so that both parks will be put out for construction together. So the same contractor will be um, hired to build both parks simultaneously. So we anticipate that we will, after um, we will go through the design process through the beginning of the summer, and we expect to have the drawings ready to to select the contractor by late summer, and then begin construction in the fall. Uh, these are all loose guide, uh, loose timelines, but that is our anticipated schedule. So if we were constructing in the fall, then we would have the bulk of the work done by the end of, um, before the winter sets in and, and might have to do some minor uh, construction completion in the spring. Thank you for Patricia. Um, there is a comment here from Peter. And Peter, you can always clarify if you are asking a question about Bert Mounier instead, but he says he is pleased to retain the mature trees and can you also retain the natural elements? I'm sorry, could you please repeat that, Jen? Sure, and Peter, if I haven't captured your question accurately, feel free to use the raise hand function so that I can unmute you. But he is asking if we can retain the natural elements. So Peter, I see you have your hand raised, so I'm just gonna unmute you, okay? I was uh, interested in the pictures and the drawings looked like a, a little bit of like a golf course. Uh, and I like the idea of the pine trees and, and the maple trees and the others being retained and so on. Uh, but all, also just the natural uh, ground, is that uh, going to be retained or will it be a uh, seeded lawn with uh, spring dandelions and maintenance issues or will it be, I, I really like the natural elements that uh, are there presently. And I realize you can't always retain most of that, but uh, maybe you can comment on that. And this is to do with uh, Ma uh, Max, yeah. Yeah, Ma Max Crescent, uh, we are looking at keeping the, the woodlot as is, uh, and then doing some enhancement plantings within there. Uh, the intent is not to, to clear out the, the ground story that, that's existing and, and sod the area. Uh, the development would be uh, basically uh, contained to the area required to install the, the playground and the playground space uh, and the pathways. Uh, but really we, you know, we understand the, uh, the existing natural condition there. Uh, and the whole intent of this and the whole theme of the of Max Crescent is, is to, to, to keep that natural feel to it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, there is a comment and a question from Councillor Chappelle, and he notes that for Max Crescent, the survey online does not really show the wood-like structures and that it's hard to determine which is the better selection. So I'm going, I'll help you with that one, Councillor Chappelle. Um, so we do have the, um, sometimes on the online surveys, the pictures can seem very small. And um, so what we can do is we can add those into the Get Involved page so that they're bigger. And there's always the um, 
the presentation panels in there, you can download those. But for anybody who has any concerns or questions about the Get Involved platform, please do reach out to the communications team and we can help you with those. We also, if you would prefer to complete the survey in person, we can send, or sorry, in person or on paper is we can send those out to you and we can send you a paper copy of what those playground structures would look like. And then we can also include a prepaid envelope and you can send those back to the city. So Councillor Chappelle, let me know if that addresses your concerns and we're happy to make any modifications to make the survey easier to complete. Okay, it looks like that we have captured most of the questions about Max Crescent. So is the project team ready to move on to Bert Mounier? Jen, can I ask one question? Yes, of course. Uh, just to clarify on Max Crescent, um, the playground area, usually we like to do a small um, a graded lawn. It may be a bit of an informal natural lawn adjacent to the playground. So when the kids go crazy and they, they run out, out of the playground area, they have a little bit of a smooth surface to run onto. So I think, uh, not to contradict our designer, but I think we may end up with, with some uh, lawn area around the actual play structure. Uh, so just didn't want um, us to give you uh, the misinformation that 100% of that park will stay forest floor and leaf clutter, um, although most of it will. Um, thanks. Okay. Um, Jen, can we move to the, go two more slides forward? Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to now address some of the questions that were submitted in advance for um, about Burp Unier Common. Um, we had a number of duplicate questions, so I framed them here more as talking points in an effort to communicate the information as efficiently as possible. Um, so the first questions I had were about benches and providing more shade. Uh, so, in both of the two options that Steve presented, there are new benches proposed along the si alongside the new pathway. And as is shown in option two for the basketball court, there is a proposed concrete wall that will also function as seating. Um, for shade, uh, we're going to uh, plant several new canopy trees that will be planted. Uh, they will be placed along the pathway near seating areas and near entry and exit points in order to maximize their use for shade purposes. Uh, gazebo is not proposed as part of the project. Uh, we also got a question about um, the play field and its use for various sports. So the sports field that's proposed in the open space option one, that could include goals goals, physical goals for soccer play. And as a mini field, it's not confirmed if the field would be programmed by the soccer clubs or if it would just be left um, available for neighborhood use. That same field could also support informal play for other sports such as ultimate frisbee, rounders, football, or softball cricket. The site's not really large enough to support full on cricket play with a hard ball, um, but it could support softball. Cricket. Tennis is not proposed for the site. Tennis court locations um, in the city are currently being considered as part of the Parks and Recreation Master Plan. And if you'd like to see where, what the proposed locations are or what is being considered, you can view the Parks and Rec Master Plan online. Uh, next slide, please, Jen. Uh, flooding of the ice rink, we were asked about this, and I want to explain that the ice rink at Burnt Munier was a community maintained ice rink for one season. Uh, that means that community members volunteered to take on the responsibility for flooding and maintaining the rink. And in support of that volunteer effort, the city provided the water hydrant and the sideboards for the hockey play. Um, the volunteer group disbanded this year. Um, but there are currently opportunities for other groups to step up and look after the ice rink for next year. The city doesn't main the, maintain the rink in this location. 
Uh, we also had a question about community gardens and if there is sufficient interest within the community then the interested members can get together to submit a proposal to the city there's potentially enough space here to accommodate one and so to see what's involved you could access the community garden policy on the city's website dog park we were also asked about whether a dog park could be here um, a dog park is not supported for this site. Uh, this is because it would be too close to the neighboring residences and historically dog parks can have issues with both noise and odor. Um, furthermore, the city requires that a dog park occupy a minimum of one and a half acres in area. And while that space is, a, is here, if a dog park were to be located here, there would be limited room for any of the other elements to be implemented. Um, the dog park policy also requires that we add a parking lot on the site, given that dog parks are traditionally destination amenities. Um, next slide, please, Jen. The basketball court. Um, the basketball court is, was being developed in response to a community petition that the city received three to four years ago um, by a community group asking that a basketball court be installed here in Burt Munier Common. Um, now, I, um, I have over the last couple of days received several emails of um, concerns about that. And I want to assure you that I am logging all of those emails and I can uh, sort of give you an issue, uh, explain about the bas how we do basketball courts. Uh, when we position basketball courts in parks, we are conscientious to consider the distance between the court and neighboring residences. We also take into, considera into consideration the size of the park and we try to scale the court accordingly. For instance, in a large park, we put in a full-size court and in a smaller park, we might put in a single post and hoop perhaps with a three-point line. Um, Burt Munier is a mid-sized park. So we're proposing two hoops, but it's not full-sized as Steve may pointed out, and it won't support full-on five-on-five team play. Um, because we don't, because of this, we don't expect vehicular traffic to increase because of the basketball court or because of any of the other proposed amenities. Other noise-related concerns were the bongos that are attached to the play structure in the playground. That's the existing playground that's already there. So now that we're aware of the issue, we will certainly look into it and see if we can come up with a solution for those. Parking, parking and safety. Uh, those, I've also received several emails about that, which I'm also logging. Um, there is no additional parking proposed as part of this project. While there is some on-street parking allowed in the laybys, we have heard concerns about illegal parking and the related safety issues. The city has bylaw enforcement. They can be contacted to address these concerns. And that being said, and having heard your concerns, we have already taken some of those issues back to our colleagues at the transportation department for their consideration. Uh, the last question was uh, someone asked if there was a five, ten, five to 10 year plan for the development of the park. Um, no, after this work that is currently being proposed is completed, the park is not expected or planned to get any significant further improvements. Um, now, that, those are all the questions that I've already received in advance and now we can open it up to uh, for new questions to be raised. Thanks, Patricia. So as I said at the beginning of the meeting, there were 36 people that were registered to attend and we have 31 people with us on Zoom right now. And we've got about 30 questions in the Q&A. So we're going to try and get to as many as we can. Um, we're also really respectful of your time and I see that it's 6.45 p.m. So what we're going to do instead of closing at seven as scheduled is we're going to extend today's meeting to 7.15 to make sure that everybody's um, feedback is received. Um, 
a few people have used the chat to an, uh, add in their questions. And so thank you for moving those over to the Q&A. And this is in, in line with what Patricia said about logging everybody's comments. So when they're added into the Q&A, we can make sure that it's all received in the same manner and that everybody's feedback is received. So I'm going to start up at the top of the Q&A. Um, and there's a couple of comments from Councillor Chappelle. And he notes that the survey has an error online and the photo of open space option one and option two are the same. So thank you, Councillor Chappelle, for flagging that. As soon as this session is over, I'll go in and take a look at it. Um, the survey is open. And if we spot an error, we'll get that corrected. Um, if you have any concerns, please do reach out to the project team or to the communications group and we'll get that taken care of. The options are also available in the um, in those presentation panels, both on Get Involved Kingston and on the um, on the Parks and Shoreline project page on the city's website. Um, so we have a couple of comments from Rochelle and she says that she appreciates that the city's keeping as many mature trees as possible. Um, she also says her four-year-old says that he prefers the park with the green slides. So thank you very much for that. We like getting feedback from the little ones who are actually using the equipment. Um, and she also notes that she prefers the soccer field type. So I, we note that there's a lot of people that are offering feedback on their specific preferences. So thank you for that. Um, be sure that you're also completing the survey on Get Involved Kingston. There is a comment from Dan and he notes that the seat wall is a great idea. We have a question. Oh, yeah, sorry, yeah, go ahead, Neil. Just interject a little bit. Um, thank you, Mr. Lambert. I uh, appreciate that comment. Um, we've got a similar seat wall in size and shape that you could go and look at it. It's in the east end of town. It's in a park um, called Greenwood Park West. It's a small parkette with a small playground. Um, but it's a lovely uh, amenity, so we can provide that information uh, afterwards. But again, located uh, in a park that was built about four or five years ago. Um, but what I wanted to comment about um, the seat wall and the landform with that particular option for basketball is that most of the noise generate, there's two kinds of noise generation that comes out of basketball. Um, there's the, the bouncing of the ball. Um, on the ground and that's a noise generation location and then there's there's a, a, a much lower noise that will come off of a, a backboard being hit by a ball. Um, the, the, that second noise generation is usually um, mitigated by the type of backboard we use uh, but the, the one that's down off the ground which is that repeated sort of drumming of the ball that if you surround a, um, a basketball court with a low seat wall or a low stone wall, concrete wall or a landform, it greatly blocks that sound and sort of keeps it in that immediate area. So, so it's not just for seating, but it's actually for, for, um, for mitigating noise. Thanks, uh, Jen. Okay, moving on to a question from Arthur. And he says, um, with the larger open area parts of Burt Mounier Common, would the city consider installing some pathway lighting? I can answer that one. I think the answer is yes, we would consider it. I don't think we have the budget for it, but we're, we're certainly happy to look at it. We did put lighting in Bert Munier already uh, a number of years ago. Uh, my gut feeling is I don't think the budget is there to support it, but uh, it's a great comment and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll definitely have a look at that. Okay, I see questions from both Michelle and from Richelle, and their questions are quite similar. And it's about fencing around the basketball court. Um, Michelle's question is specifically about court B, and I believe Mich Richelle's question is about in general, and it's related to safety concerns. Yeah, at this point for both of the basketball courts, uh, we have not provided uh, fencing around them, uh, but maybe Patricia, if you could speak uh, further to any uh, other courts within the city and, and, and how you uh, do develop them with or without fencing. Yeah, um, for, this, for a basketball court of this size and it's being informal in nature, I don't think that fencing would be, um, 
we wouldn't typically put fencing around this type of a court. Uh, that being said, we are going to absorb all the comments that we received tonight about the basketball court and consider all, all the different options. Um, and if fencing is desired um, in the end, we, we will consider that. Um, although I would say with this, the current size that we're proposing, I don't, I don't think that that would be warranted. Thank you. Thanks, Patricia. Going to move over to a question from Kim and she would like to ask her question. So Kim, I'm going to unmute you. Take it away, Kim. Jen, can you hear me? Hello? Jen? We can, we can hear you, Kim, go ahead. I just want to make sure. Um, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to have a voice. I really appreciate this. We live directly across from Burt Newman Commons, and we've been here for three years. And it's very echoey. Um, the young kids go and sit there till sometimes till three in the morning, and they're on the swings, and we can hear them with our windows open. We have to actually shut our windows. And uh, this year with COVID, there's been groups of 50 of them hanging out there and breaking glass, streaking down the street, drinking throwing the garbage cans, um, just really reckless behavior. And so I really am concerned about, and I didn't put my survey in yet, but I'm really concerned about having a basketball court because I think it, the noise will just be really bad here. As well, I'm really worried the cars go speeding in this area. Like, I don't know if, if anyone's considered stop sign around the park or um, speed bumps, but we've, we've asked for um, four-way stops or different things, three-way stops to be, um, implemented because the cars race around here, especially at nighttime, like probably doing 80 and just smashing their brakes on. So um, I have some concerns and, and I was the one who actually put the suggestion in about the dog park because, and maybe it can't go in this park, but if you could consider it somewhere in the area, there's a lot of seniors that live in the condo building and in the houses that don't have huge backyards and they have animals. And they've been telling me they've been driving to different dog parks, which are hard for them to get to. And so that's why I suggested as well, there's a lot of fear, I think, from some people walking and using the park about um, dogs. And so I think it would be nice to have some sort of a dog park here, especially for our elderly neighbors. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Kim. Oh, sorry, Patricia, did you want to address any of Kim's concerns or did you want me to move along to the next set of questions? Well, I, I can address them. I wasn't sure if it was more of a statement or, and if, uh, but I do know that I've received uh, several comments that are similar to Kim's concerns about uh, the noise um, and antisocial behavior in the park in the evening. So we are taking all of that in and um, digesting it. It's very hard for us to comment on that type of behavior when developing a park. Um, but now that we know that it exists, um, we will um, perhaps modify our, our plans accordingly. And in terms of the traffic, um, we have uh, taken back some of the issues that were uh, presented to us to the, our colleagues at the transportation department for their review. Um, and I, I can't comment on how they're gonna proceed with it, but we have started the conversation with them. Thank you, Patricia. Um, just as a reminder, we're going to extend tonight's session to approximately 7.15 to make sure that we um, answer everybody's questions. Um, I also just wanted to note that Councillor Chappelle has added into the Q&A that should any resident on the call this evening wish to contact him, he'd be pleased to take his call he'd be pleased to take your call and email. Um, he provides his email address, um, if anybody would like to take this down and his phone number. And it's also on the city's website. Um, and the project team is also working on some materials that Councillor Chappelle will be distrib distributing in his district. So Councillor Chappelle's contact information is schappelle at cityofkingston.ca and his phone number is 613-328-5842. Um, I'm going to move along to a question from William and he just notes that please consider safety for seniors in connection with more vehicle travel on Augusta and 
um, on Augusta Drive. Going to move along to um, the, we have some duplicate questions, and I just want to make sure that um, we're getting to some of the um, some of the questions that haven't been addressed yet. So there's a question here from Wayne, and it's about Bert Mounier, and he's asking about consideration given to parking um, space for the facilities. So I believe this was addressed before, but does any anybody from the project team want to just um, address parking again? Um, I think I can answer that. I just found his question on the Q&A. Um, there's no additional parking proposed for this project. And you're right, there are six, um, there's let's, currently six to 10 cars. Yes. So that's one of the issues that we've taken back to the transportation department to review, um, not knowing how they're going to respond, but they're at least looking into it. And I can confirm that we aren't adding additional parking as part of the project at this time. So Terry and Michelle, we do see your questions. We see that your questions are about designated parking um, and uh, considerations for noise, parking and traffic. So the project team, um, we've talked about those ones tonight. I just wanted to let you know that we do see your questions and that they will be reflected in the feedback received on this project. Um, we have a question from Michelle regarding a cricket pitch and a dog run on the east and west side. So Patricia, this is a question that you received earlier. Um, did you just want to um, maybe just make a quick comment on Michelle's questions? Yeah, yeah, I can address those issues, Michelle. Um, so for the cricket pitch, we feel that the sports field that is offered in option number one could support informal softball cricket play. Uh, the space in that West field is not large enough for full on cricket, um, but it could definitely support a, a pitch and, and have pick up cricket, if that's a term I just made up. Um, uh, for the dog park, a dog park, the city has a dog park uh, policy and that policy requires that a dog park have be uh, in an area that's a minimum of one and a half acres and uh, this site is large enough however um, the dog park would be very close to the neighboring residences and the dog parks have issues with both no noise and odor and that can be a concern for the neighboring uh, neighbors um, have something else to say about that. Uh, oh, if the dog park were gonna be here because of the size it would take up, um, it would be very hard to have the other proposed elements installed alongside of it. And the, the dog park would also require that we install a parking lot, um, given that dog parks would lead to an increase of traffic and their traditionally destination uh, parks. Okay, thanks, Patricia. Uh, I see a question from, uh, I believe, Yan, um, and he asks, for Bert Mounier, the asphalt path will be, he asks, will the asphalt path be a looped path so that joggers don't need to leave the park to make unlimited exercise? I can answer that question. I, I feel like uh, um, we looked at um, a looped path inside of the actual um, western end of, of Bert Mounier. Uh, we thought that because there is um, a private laneway that, that's, that's adjacent on the lower sort of edge of the park, and a lot of pedestrians use that space anyways, even though it's technically private, um, that a, a, a looped pathway that ran parallel along the bottom edge of the park would be a bit redundant. In addition, there's a whole, a whole street system that these, these, these pathways connect to. And there is a looped pathway system that's actually within the central and the um, uh, main eastern part of the, of the common. So the answer is no, uh, this plan doesn't propose a looped path. Um, it is challenging to, it would be challenging to squeeze a looped path around a formal play field, uh, rectangular play field. Um, 
it's quite it's quite wide. Um, so I think that if that was the other reason why we didn't did not consider showing a, a looped path system. Um, but uh, but it is a good comment, and we did look we did look at it and measure it out uh, at least three or four times. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Um, I see questions from Heather and Jackie, and these are timing questions about the completion of the project. So I know we talked about this a little bit before, but Jackie and Heather, we see your questions. Patricia, can you just remind everybody of the timing for these projects? Yes, um, we are aiming to um, hire the contractor in late September and late summer, and then anticipate that they will start construction in the fall. Um, we are hoping that they will get the bulk, the substantial work done for the project before the winter. Uh, that would be uh, weather-based. And then any uh, remaining work would be completed in the spring of 2022. Thanks, Patricia. So everyone, it's seven o'clock. Uh, we're not going to close the session. Um, there's still about 30 questions in the Q&A, so we're going to try and get through them as quickly as we can. Um, I'm going to move along to a question from Jackie, and they ask, can consideration be given to a larger basketball court with a north-south orientation more in the middle of the oval where there seems to be enough space? I'd like to answer that question. Um, I agree with Patricia that we are taking in feedback on the basketball court. Um, we, uh, we were comfortable with the scale of the essentially cross court or half court uh, with two nets. Um, I, I do think we need to uh, take in feedback over the next couple of weeks on, on how people are feeling about the court. Um, you could uh, young, younger people in you know, 12, 13 year olds could play full, you know, end to end in a half court, just like they do in a junior school. I don't think a full size basketball court, which is typically 84 feet long by 50 feet wide, about twice what you see out there in, in, in Steve's design. I don't think that would suit this site. And I think you'd end up with, um, it would function as a real destination. People would drive to it as opposed to just the neighborhood kids going to use it. Um, so while I, I don't want to say no to in a public meeting, my gut feeling is it might not be the right site to go larger with basketball, uh, but we'd, we'd really like to try and retain two nets, um, but we have some other ideas about how we might be able to do that and, and still um, so, so that there's enough play experience for, for more than just a couple of kids, um, but perhaps also address some of the concerns about noise and gathering. Um, but we need to put pen to paper on that. Thanks. Thank you, Neil. Erica, I see your questions. You have three questions in the Q and A, and I'm going to I'm going to paraphrase them if that's okay, just in the interest of time. So Erica has comments and questions about uh, the city's plan to deal with the influx of population into the neighborhood, um, and about plans for parks closer so that Bert Mounier isn't overcrowded. Um, she also has concerns about increased parking issues and then um, some antisocial behaviors um, about gatherings of teenagers, which can be disruptive to the residents. Um, can the project team address any of those concerns? And thank you, Erica, for those questions. And I hope I paraphrase them correctly. Uh, hi, Jen. It's me again. Um, I, I just wanted to answer the first question because I saw it earlier in the in the in the Q and A, and I looked it up. So, the Terra Verde development, which are new townhomes and and low rise um, buildings located on Centennial um, at uh, um, north of Costco, is getting a park. So it's getting a one acre park, and it is scheduled to start construction in twenty twenty three. Um, so that's the good news um, is that it's it, it's actually um, going to get its own playground area likely the community will want a playground area and that will that will help balance out some of the the load of, of new residents. That being said, I, I also want to recognize that the new housing that's occurring you know in the phase of the subdivision that's around the Max Crescent Park um, and then up by, by Del Mar Avenue, you know, the, those, those, <clears throat> those new homes and those new families 
<clears throat> they are, they are, they are, Bermuda Common is their park, is their community park as well. And that's actually the reason why we're bringing improvements to the park now. Um, so things like an opportunity to play ball, uh, basketball, or an opportunity to have a, a pickup game of soccer um, or, uh, or another field sport. Um, that was the reason why those improvements are coming now. Um, and, and the park is essentially getting developed kind of in two phases. Once uh, about in 2015, I think, late 14, we finished the first phase. And then this is kind of the second phase. Um, it's to reflect some of that influx of population. Thanks. Uh, the other two questions I think we've already addressed uh, uh, adequately. Thanks, Neil. Uh, Robert has a question about whether or not the basketball court would be lit up at night. And if so, if the lights would be shut off or when the lights would be shut off. I can answer that question. Uh, there's no plan right now to light the basketball court. Um, and so in terms of shutting them off, they wouldn't be there to shut off. Um, and again, uh, we will be reviewing all the input we get for the regarding the basketball court um, and reporting back as to how we're going to proceed on that. Thanks, Patricia. Um, I, like I said, I'm being mindful of the time. So at 707, there's still about 28 questions and comments in the Q&A. So maybe um, because we're all connecting virtually right now, can I just get a show of hands from our project team if they are comfortable with continuing until we wrap up all of the Q&A? And even attendees, if you're able to stay with us, um, a show of hands if you're able to um, continue until we finish the Q&A. Jen, I've looked through the, uh, the questions and parking and uh, uh, antisocial evening behavior seems to make up about two thirds of them. So I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to say that we will take them all in and pile them all up together and address them with our bylaws folks, our parking folks, and our transportation folks, and make sure that um, those concerns are seriously addressed. Um, and provide some feedback about how to fix that in the future. Um, and, and I do understand that it, it's, it may have some sway over um, the community's comfort level with adding new elements to the park, um, but it shouldn't. Uh, we should be focusing on sort of what our park's gonna look like for the next 20 years, um, as opposed to the behavior that um, probably increased a little bit due to the pandemic and you know this summer might be busy as well because people are shut at home um, so I, I think i'd like to get away from those questions and if we did that uh, you might actually find that you can get through the balance of the questions certainly by 7 15 or 7 maybe we can go to 7 20 i don't want to keep people too late this evening okay thank you neil um so as Neil said, I'm going to focus on the questions that are more um, specifically about the projects themselves. So bear with me, like I said, we've got lots of open questions in here. Um, thank you everyone for your patience. So Hong has an interesting question, and yeah. I don't know if it's been addressed already in the work that's gone in so far, but he asks, um, have you done any study on residents' populations, children, teenagers, and seniors? So I know it's not related to the project work itself. Um, can the project team address that, though? I muted myself. You were probably all hearing me roll my mouse to get through questions. Um, Sorry, yeah, so absolutely we have. Uh, we, we've got a, um, our recreation department has a parks and recreation master plan um, um, occurring right now. And there, the main goal of those plans is to forecast out the change in demographic and the change in the age of our population and what our population is interested in for both indoor and outdoor recreation. Um, and, and the new neighborhoods actually are a really big piece of, of that growth of our city. If we're going to get ten or eleven thousand people, you know, growing over ten years in the city, 
Um, that, that forecasted demographic is well laid out. Um, we do see that the, uh, the age demographic trends are still supportive of, uh, of a lot of their typical park amenities. Uh, we do have um, a growing older adult population, um, which is, is typically favors a lot of uh, shade pathways and benches. Um, those are really popular amenities um, for older adults and our, our youth population is growing too. And then we are uh, aware empirically and sort of means through word of mouth and what we see in the streets and what we hear from our community that, um, that we have a lot of very um, young families coming into the new homes in, in Del Mar and in the, the sixth phase of of the development uh, north of, on, of Anderson. And, and that's just because new families buy new homes and some of the families who live in, you know, closer down to Rona, they've been there for, you know, for almost 10 years. So their kids have grown up and moved on. So yeah, we are seeing a blend. Uh, we do recommend that there's at least three older adult commu tailored communities um, in, in, in the Cat North community. So we recognize that that's, um, that's part of our demographic, um, but it is, it is a blend of, of young families and uh, older adults, which is wonderful. Um, and that was sort of part of the intent of this neighborhood. Um, so yes, we are familiar with the, with the demographics of Cat North. Thanks. Thanks, Neil. I have a, a second question from Hong that is about the um, about the project specifically. And he notes that both options for basketball court are too close to the road um, and the splash pad. And um, he's wondering if the safety, safety issue has been discussed. Okay, I can answer that one, Jen. Uh, so looking at basketball option number one, it's approximately 25 meters away from the road. Now that, that distance is the same that we would use for a sport uh, such as baseball, where uh, the ball would leave the, the field at a high velocity and travel fairly far. Uh, basketball, uh, we wouldn't be concerned about a ball traveling that far, especially with the orientation that we have. Uh, the court, the, the sideline is parallel to the road and the majority of the balls that are leaving the court are going to come out of the baseline. So uh, without a road, um, parallel to the baselines. Uh, we don't have any concerns with that one. Uh, basketball option number two, it's about 45 meters away from the road. So again, no concern with the traffic. Um, and to answer the, uh, the comment about the playground and the spray pad, the, the basketball court is actually at a lower elevation than the, the, the spray pad and the basketball court. Uh, so the ball's leaving the court and, and, and making their way to the, uh, to those areas, uh, we don't foresee that happening. Uh, again, the ball would have to leave perpendicular to the to the sidelines of the court, and, and uh, yeah, we, we don't have any concerns of the the ball being a safety concern for for any of the other park users. Thanks, Steve. Um, Heather and Terry, I see your questions and they, they seem to be specifically about the rink. Um, so Heather's question is about um, why the rink isn't maintained by city staff. Um, and then the other one's about the no puck rules. So it's outside the scope of um, this particular engagement session, but Heather and Terry, I just wanted to let you know that we do see your comments. Uh, I don't know if anybody from the project team just wants to address those or um, Terry and Heather, we do have information on the city's website about the community rank policy. Yeah, thanks Jen. I think the, um, the, 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 the no puck rules related to, um, uh, related to uh, limitations from a COVID perspective, I think are on the, on the website. Um, so I, I, and I'm not the right person to speak to that, but I will say that I do know that the city does maintain um, a number of rinks around the city and that distribution is, is essentially set. And a number of years ago, there was an outdoor rink policy established that recommended that no new city operated rinks be, um, be created, but it knew that, um, and that's, that's largely due to service level and cost, <clears throat> but it knew that, that there would be community need for um, for, for rinks, excuse me. And it suggested that 
we develop a, um, an approach where, <clears throat> forgive me, uh, where community rinks could be uh, operated by community members and, and, and flooded on their own. So that's how this one developed. Um, I think that's all I had to offer on that. Thanks, Neil. Um, being mindful of time, it's 7.15. Um, there's still a number of questions within the Q&A, but as Neil had pointed out, a lot of them um, are focusing on um, the parking concerns, antisocial behavior. Um, but I also do see a lot of really kind comments from people who are participating tonight. Um, so Valerie, um, we see your comment that you're looking forward to the project. Erica, we see your comment um, thanking Patricia for acknowledging her question, acknowledging your questions. Um, Dan, we see your feedback about lighting and fencing. Um, I'm not really seeing any other questions that are specific to um, the playground amenities um, or other parts of the project that we were looking to receive feedback on tonight. Um, as I said, everything that is uh, captured, uh, that everything that was entered in the chat in the Q&A will be uh, considered and included in the reporting back. I also wanted to point out that on Get Involved Kingston, there is a survey open on both the parks and the park amenities. And then today we did add um, another option in there about additional comments that you would like to add. Um, and it's a way for you to add written feedback um, to the project. And you can always reach out to the project team directly like some of you have done already. Um, does the project team, I'm just about to launch the, um, I guess like the final evaluation poll. Does the project team have anything that they would like to add before we sign off for the evening? Um, I've been through the questions again, uh, Jen, and uh, we're gonna, they're recorded, so we'll be able to savor them a, a little bit more, but I don't think we're missing any, any responses right now. Um, uh, just, um, we will get back to you, we will, um, um, provide a recommended final plan for both parks. Uh, and, and like Patricia says, uh, we're always willing to make some adjustments um, to, to blend some of the designs or, or reflect some of the concerns. But we, I, think we've heard, I think we've heard the concerns loud and clear. I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing what the survey results are and any feedback we get from that. And I just wanted to say thanks a lot, Jen, for, for helping us do this meeting. So thanks everyone for joining us and staying on a little bit later this evening. Um, like I said, we did have a lot of people participate. We've launched a, um, I guess a poll here and we're asking for you to just take a few seconds to complete it. And it's about, it's about the public engagement online format specifically. So it's not about the project. It's just about your experience with the technology this evening. And this just helps us improve the way that we offer these sessions. Um, like I said, as a reminder, those polls and surveys are all open on Get Involved Kingston and they'll close on uh, March 25th. Um, again, on behalf of the city, thank you for joining us this evening. I'll keep the poll open for about another minute or so, but if you need to leave, thank you very much. Um, and have a great evening, everyone. Thank you. And it looks like everyone has completed our evaluation poll. So thanks so much for that feedback. Um, this session was recorded and live streamed to YouTube. So if you weren't able to stay for the entire evening, you can go back to the city's YouTube channel and rewatch there. And you can go to the city's website to take a look at the presentation panels. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us this evening.